all of these type of things at our kind of core resilience aspects. Slow moving traffic, water penetrating through through permeable pavement, adding green infrastructure, making happy people, and then giving place for uh, for birds, plants, and, and all those things can be woven into cities. So it doesn't just have to be a land protection, conservation, environmentalism, where nature is out somewhere else. Cities can become much more sort of nature-based. Uh, and what we're seeing is a lot of examples of that starting to, to starting to sprout uh, in these areas. I think when you look at this, you kind of imagine, uh, it kind of looks like an auto-oriented map, right? It looks right. like the belt belt loop around Houston or something. Right. <laughs> but it's a loop for bikes. Right. Uh, yeah. And it's a loop for livability right in the core of the city. And to me, that's why I sent you over this image, was it really, you, you get this sort of sense of opportunity. Uh, and then imagine, uh, you know, we looked at the examples before, there's green infrastructure going in all, all these places. Right. So in addition to just bikes and transportation, there's green infrastructure. And then when you sit next to these places, it's quiet. It, and yeah. their places. So all of a sudden, it's this linked network place throughout the core of the city. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns Channel. I'm John Zimmerman. And that was Professor Billy Fields. Uh, Billy is actually an associate professor at Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. And for those of you who listen to this podcast, that name is probably familiar to you because he was on in season two in episode number 74 when we were talking about his book that he had just had published. Uh, we do mention that book in this episode as well, but mostly we talk about uh, some time that he has spent in uh, Europe this summer, and um, uh, now that the pandemic has kind of calmed down, uh, he was able to bring his students uh, back over to Europe uh, for a couple weeks' stay, and so we do talk about that. And this is episode number 149, uh, second to the last episode here in season three uh, next week. Episode 150 will feature Doug Gordon from the War on Cars podcast, and it will be a live streaming event. So hopefully you'll have the opportunity to tune in live. Billy, thank you so much for joining me once again on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Excellent. I'm really excited to be here uh, and talk with you today. Yeah, fantastic. And, and 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 I mentioned welcome back because you have actually been on the podcast before. Uh, you were uh, on way back in season two, um, almost exactly halfway to where we're at now. We're almost at, uh, in fact, this episode is episode number 149 and you were episode uh, 74. So there you go, way back in season two. And uh, that was an audio only uh, broadcast. Uh, so for our listening audience, uh, you may have tuned in and, and listened to that particular episode. And for those of you here on YouTube, uh, uh, yeah, I, believe it or not, there's a whole bunch of episodes that are just audio only. And um, and really the main topic that we talked about, uh, you know, on that particular episode was the release of this book because it had just uh, it had just come out. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we start off by you know talking a little bit about that book? And again, it's uh, published by Rutledge and uh, and have that be part of your sort of introduction. Uh, so who is Billy Fields, <laughs> Professor Billy Fields, and uh, and and blend in the relevance of this particular book? Take it away, Billy. Yeah, that sounds great, John. I'm excited to be here uh, again and talk with you. Uh, so who is Billy Fields? Uh, <laughs> Billy Fields uh, is an associate professor at Texas State University. Uh, from a professional standpoint, uh, I got my PhD about 15 or so years ago. I went to work in Washington, D.C. at the Rails to Trails Conservancy as their research director. So come from a kind of an advocacy uh, background, uh, but with a research uh, bent as well. Hurricane Katrina happened and I moved uh, I'm from New Orleans originally, and I moved back to New Orleans and got very interested in, clearly, disaster recovery. Uh, and what I did is I ended up melding those two interests uh, uh, from my time in New Orleans, working at the University of New Orleans, and then my time at Rails to Trails in my research background. So here at Texas State, I focus on kind of a combination of disaster resilience uh, and active transportation research. And both of those themes are embedded in the book, Adaptation, Urbanism and resilient communities. Uh, and what we did in this book is we went to case study cities around the world, uh, London, Rotterdam, Copenhagen, uh, New Orleans, and Miami, 
Uh, and what we did is we looked at how resilient are these communities in terms of transportation. And what we found is some cities are really bouncing forward. Uh, they're using resilience as a platform to make their cities stronger and better. And some cities are kind of just doing whatever they've been doing before, kind of a status quo version and bouncing backwards when they have a disaster. And really what we wanted to do was look at what is a resilient street? And what we found was that resilient streets are really about melding active transportation, usually protected facilities with green and blue infrastructure, uh, kind of the green buffers, bioswales. When you do that, you uh, have the ability to manage water, to decrease uh, sort of flooding in your area, but you also create this nice green buffer that makes a beautiful place to walk and bike. And when you do both of those things, you create a resilient street. We can talk a lot more about that. I can go on. Clearly, I did at length uh, in the book, uh, but I yeah. appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. And we can kind of meld that into the conversation as we move forward. Yeah. And, and in fact, I think you've uh, you've provided us with uh, some video footage of exactly what you were describing is, you know, that that concept of uh, transforming a street into a more resilient environment. You, you actually call it the street of the future. Uh, yeah. So, so walk us through why this is the street of the future and what you mean well, I, by that. Yeah, first I got the name uh, from Cornelia Dinkel, Dinka, sorry, Cornelia Dinka at uh, Sustainable Amsterdam. Uh, on one of my first trips over uh, to the Netherlands, I met with her and she took me on this amazing tour. This is probably a mile or so from Central Station and this street has undergone numerous different transformations over time. It's Plantage Midden Lawn. Uh, and essentially, it started off with a, looking like a car street. Uh, and then the Dutch added a, a cycle lane to the side. And then what you see here is really this transformative street of the future. It's only about three blocks long, but there's a green uh, grass in the center for trams. There's beautiful cycle tracks. There's a park on the side. You can go sit there and really relax. And I brought, I take students to the Netherlands every year. Right. And we sat out at this spot and just examined what was happening and why it worked. And one of the real things that they said was, it's it's so quiet and pleasant here. Yeah. Uh, and I said, yeah, it is. But the other thing is I said, look at the, look at, uh, the trams going by, how many people are moving through this space? And they right. initially were perplexed. What do you mean by moving through this space? There's a tram and then 10 bikes I can see. Right. And I said, like, there's there could be up to like 100 or so people uh, on that tram. And then there's bike after bike after bike moving by. And it's just quiet and lovely. And it creates kind of a, a what it does is it privileges the sustainable transportation modes, walking, biking, transit. Right. It makes it safer, easier, quieter, nicer, and it soaks up water at the same time. And that's really the core yeah. of what resilient streets are about. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, and there's sound to this. So uh, you and I will just shut up here for a moment. I'll rewind this and we'll, we'll play it for everybody uh, because it is. It's quite, uh, it's quite nice. It's quite pleasant to be... I love it. It's, yeah. it. it's so cool because it really kind of fits that narrative uh, that Chris and Melissa talk about in their book, Curbing Traffic, that, uh, you know, cities aren't inherently noisy. Uh, cars make cities noisy. And so this is an opportunity to really kind of emphasize that uh, in, unless that tram is actually rolling by there, the most prominent thing that you hear is sort of the wind and, uh, you know, voices of people uh, talking as they're cycling, because inherently cycling, especially when you're doing upright, relaxed cycling, Dutch style, is a very social activity. And so people are carrying on conversations and doing all that stuff. So good, good stuff. Now, so you had mentioned you, you go over to the Netherlands frequently and you take your, your students with you. Um, is it primarily students just from Texas State University or is it uh, or is it open to other university students as well? Well, it, it has been just Texas State okay. students. Uh, we actually partner with Dutch students uh, while we're there. We always okay. do a project. Uh, the first week we go to Amsterdam, 
uh, and then tour around. We've been to Utrecht, to Zwala. Right. We, we go all over. The second week, we've been working in Delft and in Rotterdam. And okay. uh, we partner with Dutch students there always on a project. But uh, if you're interested, if you happen to be a student out there uh, or a student at heart and you would like college credit for studying transportation in the Netherlands, uh, please contact me. We can always arrange okay. for credit uh, to your home institution. Uh, and so uh, you can hang out with our Texas State students, our Dutch students. It's a really lovely yeah. time, and I, I encourage anyone to participate. Fantastic. So this is a summer school type of activity. How long is that uh, uh, that experience? In yeah, total? we spend uh, we spend two weeks in two the weeks. Netherlands, and then we do kind of some before and after uh, work. Uh, but you don't need to be in Texas for that uh, to do that. Got it. Uh, Got it. But uh, really what the, the the core thing that we do is it's really place based. Uh, most classes, you know, you sit in a classroom. We don't we don't do that. <laughs> the right. classroom is the street of the future. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, yeah. So we go out and we look at why this why does this place work or maybe why does this place need uh, some help? Right. And we analyze that looking at that from a transportation perspective green infrastructure perspective, and then a place perspective. Because when you're doing transportation right, like you can see in that image, it becomes a place. Nice. You, you could hang out there, you can move through, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, but that's really one of the things that I love about the Dutch streets is they're just, they're places in addition yeah. to, uh, you know, movement yeah. uh, corridors. And and the Netherlands is is extraordinary. And uh, as you, you mentioned, you, you go there and you, you bring the students there and there's a, a great deal of uh, experience that you go through, but it's not the only game in town. And in fact, uh, you spent quite a bit of time over in Europe uh, this summer, uh, making up for lost time <laughs> with uh, <laughs> the pandemic and everything. Uh, and we, we talk about that in the uh, in episode number uh, 74. So uh, because we were still in the midst of, of the challenges at that point. Um, but where where else were you this summer when you were over visiting? Yeah, I started uh, back, uh, and when we were doing Adaptation Urbanism, the book, I uh, spent some time in Barcelona looking at super elas, and we actually have a policy chapter that deals with that. We don't just deal with the case study cities. Uh, so I really, really wanted to go back and look at the super elas, elas or super blocks, as most people translate it in English. And I really like the super elas because it's like an it's like an an island, uh, a green island in the city, and that's what it feels like. Uh, and that's kind of more the the uh, translation from Catalan or Spanish. And this is uh, the image that you just put up here is one of the super elas uh, in this uh, uh, Saint Anthony uh, neighborhood in Barcelona. And imagine first you just see this amazing amount of people and public space and people moving through and, you know, there are people in uh, wheelchairs and assisted devices, there's delivery vehicles, there's cars. All of this is happening because we've slowed traffic down. We've added green space to the streets. Uh, and this is one of the temporary facilities that they've built in Barcelona. Uh, but in addition, uh, what you're seeing throughout Barcelona is that they're actually creating the long-term green infrastructure. They're going back, they're putting this in originally, and they're going back in and then adding long-term green infrastructure. So I had heard about all the changes that happened in Barcelona during uh, the pandemic, and I said, oh, I've got to go back. Uh, and so I went back, and then that was really what I found. I found first that there was an extensive network of new super elas and new uh, 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 kind of green infrastructure additions that you saw in the city. Uh, and then I went back to uh, Poble, Poble No, uh, uh, which was one of the original uh, Super Elas. And what they've done there is they've really kind of uh, gone through and taken out much of the uh, kind of temporary infrastructure and then put in long-term infrastructure. So it was really spectacular to see that over time. Um, I also went to Valencia uh, and spoke to a, a bicycle group, Valencia on BC. Thank you people out there from Valencia. It was a lovely time. Uh, we looked at the greenway system. We rode around um, this nice, wonderful cycle track uh, that advocates had created. And what I heard in Valencia is the same story that you hear in city after city. It was advocates pushing for change, working with their local communities. And now they have this amazing cycle track that, uh, uh, that it links around the old city. They've got this uh, just truly spectacular greenway system that provides safe, active transportation. And then I rode all that to the beach 
and jumped in the ocean and it had a Valencia orange and it was sweet and salty and wonderful. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it was, it, when you do these type of trips, you meet wonderful people who really open up to you and show you what works. Uh, and I really, really appreciated uh, that opportunity to see these places. And from a research perspective, there's just so much to study. You know, I, I'm yeah. kind of, I had both the tourist angle uh, on, but I also had that kind of, you know, researcher view of what was happening. So right. I, I want to go back and study what really is happening in, in Spain. I think some really good things are happening. Yeah. And I think we have another video here. Uh, what are we looking at here? This is kind of like the original type of system that uh, in many you find in many uh, neighborhoods in Barcelona. This is the Rambla de Poblano. Uh, you've heard of the Las Ramblas, uh, which is big and touristy, but still kind of nice. This is in one of the neighborhoods. And what it is, is it's just a slow street with people's face in the center. And it's kind of this original template and design that they've had for years and years and years. And basically what they've done, at least for, for me, it clicked in my head that the super elas are just taking this design that they're familiar with and then extending it out throughout neighborhoods. Uh, and to me, I, and you, when you walk through the super ela of Poblano, uh, you run right into this uh, Rambla de Poblanos. And it's just this long walk of trees. And it was, it was pretty hot the day I went. And you get underneath the trees and all of a sudden it's cool and lovely and filled with people. Uh, and that really is at the core of what this transformation is about. It's about creating places for people uh, to move, to sit, to do whatever, at the same time creating resilient places that uh, deal with the urban heat island effect, uh, that make it safer and easier to take the low uh, carbon transportation option, all those things that just sort of happen in the background, but at the core, they're really safe, inviting places, and that's why they work. Nice. And what are we looking at here? This is Avenida de Mistral. Uh, uh, and first, an apology always to local communities. I mess up your languages in whatever language I'm in, so I apologize. What's fascinating here, though, is you've got this kind of center uh, of the space that you'll see in just a second that is just green space in the center. And then these really, really small streets on either side uh, that are basically like mini trails. Uh, and this flows out uh, of the St. Anthony uh, uh, area uh, and creates this kind of linear space of green. Uh, and it's just, it's it's lovely. There are people sitting there, they're of all ages, little kids, older folks, uh, there are people moving on bikes, there are people walking, uh, and it just flows together and creates this, this amazing, lovely space. Uh, that also works really well for walking, biking. And then sometimes you'll find little cars in the area. Uh, this is actually adjacent to that street. Uh, and this shows you what a regular Barcelona street looks like. And that's why, that, I, actually, I included this in the videos I sent you because I just wanted to show kind of what, a, what does a generic Barcelona street look like. And what you see is parking on all four corners. They've kind of created this cut in the streets, you can see parking, parking, parking. That's what most of Barcelona used to look like. And that's why these super illas are amazing because they're basically retaking that space, turning it, and then the one in St. Anthony has a square in the center. Yeah. Uh, and then utilizing that space for public space and then having cars snake through. You can have yeah. cars, you just need to move slow. And then when you do that, especially in a place like Barcelona that has, it's used to having public spaces, all of a sudden it's like a magnet. People join those spaces. It's, yeah. it's it really, and that's why I wanted to include that generic street because that's what they dealt with before. And then that transformation is all the more uh, important when you see it in that context. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, the other sort of common name for the super is, uh, is a super blocks. Why don't you describe that for the audience as to, to what it looks like? So if you were like looking down on a map of Barcelona, uh, what is the description of what a, the super block is? Yeah. So first, the super block makes sense as an English translation because it is uh, basically a series of blocks where you where you're basically putting in traffic calming, and then sometimes not allowing any traffic. So it is kind of a super block, but super block is kind of this big modernist way of describing things, right? Super blocks are what you do when you put in a high rise buildings. What you see in Barcelona is exactly the opposite. It's like a network of traffic calm streets that sometimes allow traffic through, but at very low speeds. 
Uh, and then there are uh, uh, little green planters that they put in in the first phase. When they go to the second phase, they'll actually uh, put that in the street as green infrastructure. Uh, and then there are places for people to hang out. Sometimes there's chess boards. Uh, I loved the, the pe people playing chess. Actually, just down the street from here, there are people playing chess. There are benches uh, and there are people. Uh, when you create places for people, not surprisingly, and it's cool and nice, people will show up, especially in a, in a place uh, like this. So really transform more transformative. What they're doing now is they're actually kind of taking that model and then they're stretching it uh, into longer corridors. Uh, and they're calling them green. I think they're called green corridors. Uh, and they're basically uh, adding green infrastructure down whole segments of streets. So you're seeing... I think probably less of the, the sort of core super ELA model and more of this kind of elongated adding of green space and traffic calming. Yeah. And specifically when we when we look at the original models, uh, and they've been doing this since way before the, the pandemic, uh, by the way, folks. Uh, so uh, it, it just so happened that they accelerated a lot of this uh, during the pandemic and and, uh, and, and then after, uh, you know, we're sort of in this quote unquote post uh, pandemic era now. Um, but the way that it works is you know, on those main avenues, like the main avenue that we saw there, the, the, the speed limit in those areas will, will frequently be um, around, I, I think it was 50 kilometers per hour um, in on those main avenues. Is that uh, what there still are? Or are they closer to 30 kilometers per hour on those? I think it might be, I might be 50, but yeah. there, there's a really movement towards the 30 and then right. even lower. Uh, right. And uh, then so yeah. in the interior, so right. the original model was basically a nine block grid. And so you, you had the, the circumference of that was the, the quote unquote higher speed. And then, but in the middle, uh, it was as low as like 15 kilometers per hour, right. really encouraging super slow speeds, like seven miles per hour, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in that. And so it, when we look at this, this particular image here and we, you know, rewind it and we kind of see you know, the car moving through yeah. there, these are incredibly low speed environments. Um, and so, you know, this person's kind of, you know, going through there, maybe that person was going at, at 10 kilometers per hour. It was, you know, a very, very reasonable speed. So. Yeah, right. And you can't nice. go much fast. You literally can't go much faster right. than that because yeah. Yeah. it, and actually what it really is, and we can maybe talk about this more, it actually takes the model that the Dutch uh, have been doing for years and years and years of their 30 kilometer zones in their neighborhoods and kind of creating this long term traffic calming. And, but it does it all kind of at once. And I think that's one of the interesting things. You see chicanes, you see kind of turns as people move through. Uh, it slows uh, people, uh, it slows cars down. Uh, one thing I did see is that a number of, uh, of bikes actually sort of cut through the square in the center, some of them at higher speeds than they should. Uh, so I think management of those public spaces and squares with scooters, bikes, e-bikes, whatever, gets more interesting. And I think that's what you'll start to see as they move towards the longer term designs away from just sort of that initial tactical urbanism that you see in the image there. I yeah. actually kind of liked the tactical urbanism sections yeah. Yeah. better than I liked the stuff that they were doing long term. Long term. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's just something that was so wonderful and uh, and colorful about what those initial segments were. When you get yeah. there, like if you go down that block, there's some of the sort of long stuff, long term stuff that they're putting in. And I, it wasn't as well, kind of wasn't as nice. I yeah, really yeah, yeah. liked that. Yeah. Well, it, it also kind of uh, exemplifies the fact that you're taking over space when it's the tactical yeah. urbanism stuff. And, and, and it was very well done. It wasn't cheesy tactical urbanism yeah. stuff. I mean, it, you, you saw, you know, really nicely constructed wooden planters and, and things of that nature. Now you also had an opportunity to make it over to Paris. I know you didn't spend a lot of time there, uh, but you did uh, include a little video here of the Place de, de Bastille, I think. Um, right. Yeah. So talk, talk with me a, a little bit about what's going on here. It was a rainy Sunday morning, uh, so there weren't as many people as you would ordinarily see. Uh, but I had been, I had actually ridden through here before uh, in 2016 or 17, before all of this was uh, really remade. And it was chaotic and hectic. It was kind of this, Paris has been going through this transition. Uh, 
they first took some space from sidewalks and put some uh, uh, bike shares out and they said, have at it. And I jumped on the bike and was like, wow, this is really sketchy. <laughs> Uh, it was still doable. Yeah. Uh, but now what you see, uh, particularly in, in that uh, area, is kind of a segment, a, a network of cycle tracks that comes together. It's still more chaotic than probably you necessarily want. But that traffic circle, you know, those images of the French traffic circles with cars everywhere, that's kind of what it was before. And now it's much more calm. And then there are these linkages. And, and the seg- uh, image that you, you saw was kind of a linkage back uh, into neighborhoods and the cycle track network. And that's the yeah. segment that I really wanted to go check out, uh, but I didn't have time to, uh, to check everything out. So uh, look, I, I think uh, Clarence Eckerson was just yeah. there with uh, Street Film. So he yeah. they do a whole lot more on that, uh, but it gives you an, 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 just kind of a glimpse of what's happening there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clarence is still uh, cranking out videos right now. So uh, definitely head over to Street Films and check out some of uh, the the you know, footage that he is, uh, is getting out there. I think he's up to, I think he just published uh, his fifth video from, from his stay there. So, uh, I was very, very jealous that he was able to make yeah. it back before <laughs> I was, uh, cause it's been since 2015 for me. So, uh, but one of the places that I visited, uh, back in 2015, uh, was this, Where, what are we looking at here? Yeah, this is uh, this is kind of the high line uh, of Paris, uh, and there are several different uh, names for it. Uh, and my French is bad, uh, so John, is is your French any better? Uh, <laughs> Not really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we'll just call it the, the my students called it the high line of of uh, Paris. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but what you see here is a kind of an old uh, uh, aerial. Uh, it was an old. Uh, rail line and the old rail line uh, essentially became defunct. And what they did is created this linear park along it. And this is actually why I went uh, to Paris because my students were working on a project like this uh, called the Hofplein in Rotterdam. Rotterdam's trying to do the same thing. And you can really see what's happening uh, in Paris. Lots of the streets uh, have cycle tracks. Uh, There's a cycle track that runs parallel uh, to to this uh, linear park. Uh, and then you can see uh, uh, as well that there's a, a cycle track that runs back into the neighborhoods. And they're not perfect. Uh, I watched a right. lot of near misses and weird things happen uh, through here. But what I also saw was cars are expecting bikes more. That seemed to be what stood out to me uh, from my short time in Paris uh, was that there are just a lot more bikes on the street. I saw kids and parents, uh, and they were all out in spaces that I considered fairly suboptimal in right. many ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the cars were, because there's so many bikes now, uh, cars are aware that bikes belong on the street. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, cyclists are moving from protected facilities into unprotected facilities, uh, but there seems to be a slower dance that's happening. And really, that was the sort of transformative thing that, that really stood out to me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I do love this particular activity asset. Uh, you know, it it is a viaduct, but you can really get an, a sense as to how tall it is, how high up it is. Yeah, because this yeah. is really looking down upon the city street. And so, uh, what's really really quite fantastic about when you're up there is it really truly is a, a linear park. And much of it, as you continue along there, you get into a whole series of. Uh, of green spaces and other parks. And uh, it really is, uh, not only do you have that perspective of being up higher, uh, it, so you sort of feel like you're in the trees yeah. and then uh, and then there's many, many uh, other green spaces there. Talk a little bit about that concept. We, we touched upon it just briefly when we were looking at that uh, uh, that streetcar line going through the grassy area. Yeah. But from a resilience perspective, how important is this to have this level of, of green space and the greening of the streets uh, like you showed in, in Barcelona there and, and as we just saw here on this particular facility? How important is that? Yeah, so there's a, there's if you kind of think about it, there are a number of different sort of typologies of of connected green space. 
Uh, your connected green space could be on the street like it is in Barcelona and really extending it. Oh, we talked about Valencia earlier. There, there you'd actually have a greenway uh, <laughs> there. It's a longer story about moving a river because of a flood and then taking that space and turning it into this amazing green asset throughout the city. Or there's, they're kind of leftover or lost spaces like you see in Paris uh, along the, uh, the sort of viaduct. And you can uh, transform that viaduct on top uh, and add green space. London is actually working on a, a project called the, uh, the Underline, I think it's called the Underline, uh, where they're greening the space underneath an old rail uh, uh, area like that. And then Rotterdam, which we uh, uh, visited with the students, is also working on the Hofplein uh, uh, sort of greening of another viaduct. And their project is really amazing because what it's trying to do is add biodiversity and public space uh, at the same time. You're really seeing this sort of uh, idea of taking green space and not only for a sort of, you know, human purposes, but also uh, for uh, more biodiversity. This is on the backside of uh, the image you're seeing now, the backside of Central Station in Rotterdam. Uh, and this is another one. Uh, John, if we can just let it run with, uh, with the sound, you'll just hear the birds uh, yeah. in the background. Uh, it's spectacular. Again, the, uh, we, we, we have to hit it. We uh, have to. We have to hit it again. Yeah. There we go. You could hear it. Uh, yeah. It's funny. There's a there's a fine line between uh, dead air and listening to quiet uh, right. when yeah. you do something like this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, really, uh, that those sort of sort of places uh, from a people perspective, you know, you just feel the stress like wafting away from you. Uh, but from, you know, the animals, birds, uh, biodiversity perspective, you can really plan for that. And what we're what I saw in place after place on this trip to Europe was really this focus on adding biodiversity. This is just uh, uh, adjacent to there. Uh, it used to be kind of a, a road space that's been transformed and with green space and green infrastructure added there. And you can just watch the cyclists moving back and forth. There's a, a contraflow uh, bicycle uh, lane here. Uh, and then there's another uh, cycle track, uh, or, uh, or I think it's an advisory bicycle lane on the other side. Uh, and then cars move slowly because it's traffic calmed and has the brick pavement. And around the corner from there, there's permeable pavement. So we started off talking about resilience, right? Yeah. All of these type of things at are kind of core resilience aspects. Slow moving traffic, water penetrating through, through permeable pavement, adding green infrastructure, making happy people, and then giving place for uh, for birds, plants, and, and all those things can be woven into cities. So it doesn't just have to be a land protection, conservation, environmentalism, where nature is out somewhere else. Cities can become much more sort of nature-based. Uh, and what we're seeing is a lot of examples of that starting to, to, starting to sprout uh, in these areas. Yeah. All right, Professor, tell the story of Rotterdam and why this is so impactful to, to see what has been transforming what has been happening in Rotterdam. Yeah. So Rotterdam is such an amazing place. Uh, I work with uh, Lillian Geerling uh, of HZ University, uh, and she lives in this neighborhood. She lives right around the corner from here. And she's taken me on this walk numerous times. This is on the backside of Central Station in Rotterdam. And what you see here is older uh, buildings, kind of late 1800s, a network of canals. It's lovely. On the other side of Central Station, you see modernist buildings and people always, and that's the sort of image of Rotterdam. And they wonder what happened. Well, uh, unfortunately, the Nazis bombed Rotterdam uh, and the whole, uh, most of the core center of Rotterdam uh, was destroyed. And so it was built, that core area of Rotterdam was built back uh, under sort of modernist urban uh, planning principles, build really wide streets, the car was the future, fill in your canals uh, and make more space for roads. Seriously, they did that. Uh, they, we did it too here in the United States. Uh, and then in the 1980s, early 1990s, they said, wow, 
our downtown has so little activity that happens uh, after business hours. We need to create a, a place again. And so they moved much more towards integrating, taking space away from the cars on the edges and adding uh, protected cycle tracks. And then they're moving much more towards this sort of city lounge idea of creating public space, embedding it, creating places for people. So Rotterdam actually is this a uh, great model for transformation. It's in the Netherlands, but basically it was planned uh, using auto-centric planning models. And what you can do is look at Rotterdam and see what your city could look like. It's harder if you go to Amsterdam and look at the street of the future, it's, it's hard to see that in your city maybe. But when you go to Rotterdam, you see streets that are big and wide and you know uh, that your streets can look differently because yeah. they, they did the same thing. Yeah. And just to be clear, I mean, different parts of all of these Dutch cities are at different stages of, of transformation. And so mm -hmm. you sent over uh, a nice little clipping from uh, 2018 uh, talking about a transformation of a, of a street uh, in, I believe this is, is right in um, the, uh, the Amsterdam area. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, this is Frederiksplein, uh, which is right in the center of Amsterdam. Yeah. And I was actually uh, walking here with my wife and child. Uh, and uh, I, I had been through here before, but it had been several years. And so I went uh, and I found this just amazing, beautiful cycle track. And then uh, I found a Fietstraat, uh, which is a bicycle street. Uh, and I said, this is really amazing and interesting. Uh, what's happening here? And so this is an image of the Fietstraat here. Uh, and I had been here before and I did not feel as comfortable. And I went, what happened? So I looked at that newspaper article and essentially what uh, Amsterdam is doing is they're building a ring road around the city, but not a ring road for cars, a ring road for bikes. Uh, and so I, just, I think this is just really something, and I haven't seen many people talk about this, uh, but this idea of a Fietstraat, uh, Fietstraat basically is a super traffic calm street, cars or guests, there's a, a car that comes by in the next image there, you can yeah. see the car, uh, but they're base, it's basically slow moving cars with bikes highly traffic calmed. And what you saw, if, if you, you can actually, you can do this, anybody can do this, go and look at Google Street View, and you can see how over 10 years, those the street has been changed over time. From putting in a bike lane sort of originally, and you don't see many bike lanes in the Netherlands anymore, because right. they've moved away from that. So they moved from a bike lane to kind of a uh, 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 a, a little bit more protected, painted uh, bike area to this uh, feet strut because there's so many people biking, they need to provide access. And now uh, over the next five years, the plan is to create that feet strut all the way around central Amsterdam. So you move from like the idea of building um, uh, a loop for cars, which Amsterdam right. had, and now they're building uh, a loop for bikes. And right. I just, yeah. I love, I think that's so uh, uh, nice to think about and gives you some ideas about what cities uh, are really doing to, I, I use that term bounce forward before, right. but resilience is really about bouncing forward. It doesn't necessarily protect what's there. Many right. versions of resilience are like, hey, we want to bounce back. Well, right. most cities are not socially, economically, sustainable, uh, environmentally sustainable. Right. We need to figure out how to bounce forward. What does the next version of, of the city look like? Yeah. And that's why we use, I really love that term, uh, street of the future. What yeah. do our future streets look like? And to me, they look a lot like what you saw uh, here in Amsterdam with the Fietstraat and then uh, on Plantage Middenmont. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll pull this image back up again and, and let it roll a little bit and, and, and talk a little bit about this, this concept of, of, you know, really making that shift away from just uh, kind of the narrow, limited cycle tracks towards uh, creating these feet struts uh, that are, uh, are really super um, traffic calmed environments where, uh, you know, the, the, the drivers, the drivers of motor vehicles are considered the guest in that space. And, uh, auto to gast is, is typically what you see, you know, you know, plastered over those areas to really encourage, uh, and reinforce the fact that, uh, the people who are on bikes have priority and you as the driver must remain back behind them and to 
again, a maximum speed limit in the, that environment of 30 kilometers per hour. You had mentioned it before that that 30 kilometers per hour is really, uh, you know, kind of the goal now. And there, a, a recent report that just came out looked at the injury and fatality rates that are happening on their more major streets that are 50 kilometers per hour. And they're like, yeah, this is unacceptable. Even more of those streets are going to start being converted over to 30 kilometers per hour. Uh, you had mentioned, uh, you know, before that uh, I believe about 70 percent of all the streets, especially in the residential areas, are already uh, traffic calm to that 30 kilometer per hour threshold and goal. And so you're seeing this. Uh, there is a street and there's some criteria and there's a guideline as to, in terms of how they think about this. Like in Utrecht, they had a street where, uh, you know, they had motor vehicle traffic through there uh, and they had cycle tracks on either side. And, you know, but they looked at it and they said, no, this isn't working. There's so many people on bikes. The, the people on bikes far outnumber the people in cars. And so they'd made that conversion. So they also have, uh, you know, a, an example of this where they, you know, basically ripped out the protected cycleways and put in a feet strut. And they were able to get away with that because the, the, num the volume of motor vehicles is so much lower. I believe the number is somewhere around an eight to one outnumbering the, the number of people on bikes versus, um, uh, you know, people in cars. Now, uh, so that's a new tract. Uh, Mark uh, with Bicycle Dutch has a wonderful video on that. So I encourage everybody, if you're not already subscribed to his uh, channel, be sure to do that. He also, when he produces his content, he also does it in a blog format too. So you get the video as well as a, a written blog. So um, be sure to pop over to Bicycle Dutch and do that. And I'm going to channel Mark as well on this next segment, because you had mentioned a, a fun little uh, situation that took place in Utrecht where they, they sort of had a canal like many Dutch cities had. And uh, and then the canal went away and something else came in. W what happened, you know, in, in this? And while you while you start describing this, I'll I'll play a little background video of, yeah. of what exactly happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually cite Mark in the book. This story is uh, in in the adaptation, urbanism, and resilient communities. Oh, yeah, I've never what? met him. Uh, I'd love oh, to meet never, him sometime. Never met. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just yeah. I, I was just <laughs> texting with him, and I told him I was going to do this. So let's actually let's set this up by having let's let's hear from from Mark a little bit. Okay. This motorway in the city center of Utrecht is history. space that was once designed for the car is now for people. Also people in boats. In the 1960s urban planners were convinced the car had to get everywhere and everywhere fast. Today they rather dedicate valuable city center space to people. This part of the city motorway could be used until 2010 from then on it was slowly dismantled. Now boats took the place of motor vehicles. The opening ceremony was kept very simple due to the corona crisis. But you can keep a safe social distance on the water. The people of Utrecht came to celebrate in just about everything that could float. In turn they were watched and photographed by many others. I'll uh, uh, let this continue to play and we can sort of talk over it a little bit. I mean, this is extraordinary because when we think about uh, the challenges that we have in car dependent cities globally, um, there's this thought that, you know, oh, the Netherlands, we're not going to compare ourselves to them. They've always been this way. No, they haven't. And this is a great example. Yeah. In, in the book, uh, we describe this as a disaster movie in reverse. Uh, so usually you see this image, you know, like this old image and you're like, and then here's what we did to screw it up. Right. Uh, and in the Netherlands, they're like, oh, yeah, we screwed it up. And then we decided to fix it. 
Uh, it's just so inspirational. I was just, you know, just there just a few weeks ago. It's green and lovely. And I, I had the good fortune, or I guess, of going before they did this work. Right. So I saw what it looked like before. And actually, the first time I went to Utrecht, I actually didn't really like it that much. It was very car dominated. I went, I think it was 2015. I mean, it's yeah. still in the Netherlands, so it was, it was nice. But it wasn't, it wasn't a kind of place that I went, oh, that really stands out. And I went back in 2018, 2019, and this incredible movement had started. And this, what you see here is really a reversal of the 20th century planning philosophy. So if this happened in city after city where communities basically uh, drained their city, they hid their water, and the, the future was cars. Uh, it happened in New Orleans. Uh, uh, Broad Street uh, in New Orleans was uh, had a canal and they covered it over uh, and put cars on top of it. It happened in, uh, in, in Rotterdam as well. And it happened here in Utrecht. But Utrecht is the one where they actually went and changed it. Uh, it's just unbelievable. It makes me so happy. Uh, my students, I brought my students here. And they didn't have, you know, this sort of, I, I told them, but, you know, I'm their teacher and kind of goes in and out. <laughs> they, it, it didn't have this resonance of what I had experienced. When you ex go to a place and it's a road, and the next time you go, you're seeing kids and kayaks paddle uh, uh, underneath you. Just really startling, amazing. And it just, it brings just this immense sense of joy and possibility about what cities could be. We could all start doing this. Right. Uh, we don't have to have, you know, canals everywhere, but this sort of conversion of living with water, this is kind of, to me, the prime example of what that is like. Uh, and it brings uh, uh, really this sort of intense livability <laughs> to the core of the city. It's great. It's a lovely place. Uh, and anybody who is looking for these sort of transformations, this one really stands out to me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and thanks again, Mark, for uh, allowing Definitely. me that opportunity to, to, to focus on that. Um, I will include a link in the show notes and in the video description below so that you can uh, watch that entire video if you haven't already seen it again. And if you have seen it again, you should see it again again, again. <laughs> so uh, that link will be in the video description down below, uh, as well as the show notes for the audio. Uh, since uh, you weren't able to, to actually see that uh, video, and uh, I do apologize uh, for the, the, the podcast audience. It's audio only. Sometimes we're, we're talking about stuff that's on screen, and I know that's a little awkward, uh, but uh, we, we do what we can to encourage you to Click on the 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 uh, link over to the uh, landing page on the Active Towns website, and then head over to the the YouTube channel uh, to see it in full color. Because uh, I, I do consume a fair number of podcasts by um, by audio only, but uh, uh, I, I do encourage uh, those of you just listening in uh, to see some of these visuals because they really are extraordinary, and it it really brings it to life. And Speaking of bringing it to life, you you sent me some other uh, fun little things, and you just mentioned something there about the the power of water and having that connection to water. And uh, this this little video that you sent to me of Delft, um, I'm going to have the the volume up on this one so that we can just kind of listen. Um, and this is where uh, Chris and Melissa live. Uh, again, the authors of Curbing Traffic. And uh, and that book, if you haven't already uh, picked up that book, folks, please do so. It's an absolutely extraordinary uh, book. Again, the links will be in the show notes and in the video description below. Um, but it's really a reflection um, of what their experience was like. And they wanted to capture it while it was still fresh in their mind before they were like fish in water and forgot <laughs> of you know how special it was. Uh, but let's, let's just hit play on this uh, video here and, and take a listen to Delft.
I love that part where the, the kids are coming by on the bike. You can, there's yeah. like this kind of wave of conversation. The conversation fades yeah. back. This is yeah. just uh, down from uh, the sort of uh, central station in Delft. And it, the reason that I was there with my students is we always visit the, the world's first Wernerf, uh, at least that's right. how I was told uh, yes. about it on yeah. uh, Westerstraat uh, Street. Yeah. Uh, and so that loop from the backside of Central Station, which is amazing, this they also uh, daylight. They there was a uh, an uh, elevated train uh, network there. They buried the train, brought back canals there. So it's another one of these <laughs> examples that stands out. Just that project is enough to go visit Delft with its giant bike parking garage. But if you go back into the neighborhoods there, uh, what you find is just this amazing slow uh, uh, traffic calm set of streets. Uh, yeah. And it shows how simple it can be. When I walk my students down Westerstraat, uh, you know, there's uh, the road rises uh, up to let you know that you're entering a different zone. The yeah. color changes, the brick changes. There's small little chicanes uh, in the street. Uh, and then what they've done, actually, I was really excited this time. They planted more trees on that street since the yeah. last time I had been. And I was like, oh, this is even better than I was. So many things in the Netherlands, they just don't leave alone. They're like, right. oh, no, we can, they, we, it's slow. We think about it and we fix it. And, and right. Google Street View is fantastic for this. You can go see how many freaking changes they do over 10 years. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're like, oh, that wasn't perfect. Let's keep working on it. But yeah. that one street is just this almost perfect bicycle street with water uh, in the center. It, uh, I'm seeing a lot more people. And I, I heard that uh, during the uh, pandemic, people started to utilize the canals more yeah. uh, for like stand up paddling, kayaking. So you're seeing a lot more people. I actually saw it was a really strangely hot day uh, in Delft uh, on one of the days I was there. And there was a family with a little motorboat. Uh, and they, <laughs> it was crazy. They had two yeah. little uh, stand up paddles behind and they were going through the center of Delft. Uh, yeah. There was also uh, a bicycle, not a bicycle, uh, a boat music festival that was happening right. when I was there. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Uh, all these little things, canals become public spaces. They become embedded in people's lives and they, they really add something kind of magical. Yeah. And Delft is also uh, historically uh, part of a success story of the approach to building Dutch cycle networks. They were one of the original cities uh, years ago that looked at it from the concept of you need to build a network. It can't just be uh, a few you know, extraordinary facilities. You need to be able to think about it from a network perspective and people need to be able to get around. And so they were one of the original cities that, that looked at it from that network plan and implementing. Yeah. They weren't the only one, but they were one of the early leaders uh, that sort of, uh, you know, really uh, sort of jumped off. Uh, uh, Tilburg was uh, one of the sites where the original cycle tracks were sort of like conceived and put out, but then Delft immediately followed up with, uh, you know, that concept of we need to think about this from a network perspective. So I love the, the fact that you had that. And I will be uh, in the Netherlands uh, uh, late October in uh, through mid-November. And uh, I basically just decided to, to, to book uh, an apartment the entire time. So I'm going to be in uh, Delft uh, as my uh, my home base, and then I'll make uh, trips to, to multiple cities and, and do interviews and, and filming uh, for folks. And then I think most of my uh, listeners and also viewers uh, here on the channel know that I'll be attending the International Cargo Bike Festival on the 27th through the 29th, uh, which will it'll be over by the airport there in, in Amsterdam. But I'll make that commute out there from, from Delft. Good stuff. Yeah. Now, so the big city, Amsterdam, has some really cool stuff going on, too. So uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we're seeing here. This is the De Pipe neighborhood, and this actually really kind of speaks to this element of change as well. The De Pipe neighborhood originally was slated to have a, a kind of a highway run through it. They were going to uh, pave over a canal <laughs> uh, and uh, create a, a highway system. And what you see here is what happens when you don't do that. Uh, <laughs> basically, the neighbors fought back. It was one of the sort of centers of the Stop the Kinder Mord, uh movement, the Stop the Child Murder campaign, when there was so much uh, sort of fatalities from cars. Uh, the neighborhood fought back and uh, had uh, 
up until the last few years, kind of a nice, pleasant neighborhood with low traffic. And then uh, over the last uh, few years, they've taken out a number of parking places uh, and added uh, green space. And when I was there in 2019, that process was just getting started. A uh, hat tip uh, to Street Films again, because they filmed an episode there and I immediately went and followed it <laughs> and looked to see what was happening. But we went back uh, this time with Cornelia Dinka from uh, Sustainable Amsterdam. And we looked at how and why those changes were happening. And what you really see uh, in the uh, succeeding uh, sort of two or three years is those initial uh, sort of green infrastructure pieces have now grown uh, and it's so much greener. And now uh, because they're the Netherlands, uh, they're like, no, that's not good enough. This sort of this is too temporary. Now they're getting ready to move into a much more sort of focused uh, sort of way of making permanent those changes. Yeah. Uh, and that was the neighborhood that actually had a street trampoline in it. Uh, on mm-hmm. that first image that we showed at the beginning, there was a street trampoline. They took out the street trampoline and this like broke oh, my no. heart. Apparently it was right next to someone's window and there were too many people jumping on the trampoline. Especially, uh, that this, one. Yeah. especially was, this knucklehead. I mean, my yeah. gosh, he, he just spent <laughs> hours there. I went with my child. We had a big time. I found another one, though, in case you're looking for street trampolines. In the very end of the Jordan, uh, yeah. there is a street trampoline. And then uh, in, in Copenhagen, there are a number of them. I'm a street uh, trampoline aficionado. Uh, so, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I suspect we've got a new book that'll be coming out. Yeah, street so, trampolines. So what are we, what, what what are we looking you. at here? <laughs> this is this is uh, just a sort of generic uh, street in the center of Amsterdam. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wanted to uh, send you this just to show you what uh, a normal Amsterdam street can look like. There's, you know, the DePipe with these beautiful residential streets. But there are lots of streets like this where there are a number of cars going by. Yeah. But what you see is a cycle track and a green buffer. Uh, And that cycle trap is nice and wide. It works really well. uh, And you still have motor vehicles moving uh, through. So I wanted to sort of, you know, everybody focuses on these amazing projects, which there are a number of. But the bones of how they built this system are amazing. You go from a neighborhood like DePipe right onto a street like this and you're safe the entire way. Yeah. Uh, it really shows you what a connected network looks like. And uh, just a quick point back when we talked about Delft being one of the original sort of pilot communities in the Netherlands. Uh, I just finished some research uh, on one of the pilot communities uh, in the United States because we had a pilot program back in 2008, uh, the non-motorized uh, transportation pilot program. And we studied uh, in, it just came out in Transportation Research Interdisciplinary Perspectives, TRIP. Uh, and uh, it's going to be in our urban cycling special issue uh, coming out soon. Uh, but uh, this piece looked at what happened in the pilot community in uh, Minneapolis. And what we found was bike lanes are, are good. They increase use. But connected systems and particularly protected systems increase use even more. Uh, And what we also found, uh, particularly when we looked back at Delft, was that Delft didn't see this amazing rise in bicycle ridership. They saw modest growth, uh, but it takes time. When you have a system like an automotive system that we have uh, that we've spent 50, 60 years building, putting in, you know, 10 million, 20 million dollars, it doesn't change that system dramatically in four or five years. It takes time. But if you measure at the local level, what you find is those changes start to happen. And then what you see here is where you get 30 years down the road when you create this entire network system and all of a sudden you see high bike mode shares. That's what happens at a regional level, but it takes time. And so measuring and thinking about pilots, uh, particularly in neighborhoods and cre- creating those connected systems can be a way for you to take, you know, we're not going to be Amsterdam tomorrow, but we can get there uh, moving towards that through pilots and uh, really focused work in particular neighborhoods. Yeah. And I like to, to emphasize that if you truly make it a safe and inviting uh, environment, you're going to be able to see uh, more people participating. You'll see more women participating. You'll mm-hmm. see more kids being able to uh, participate. You'll see more elderly uh, feeling like this is an environment um, that they feel comfortable in. Uh, you've you've got some key features here. You, you literally have a green buffer between the motor vehicle, yeah. the traveling motor vehicles. You have street trees that are there. Uh, absolutely critical. Uh, you also see a, a change 
there's it's represented here. Can you tell what, what I'm going to talk about in terms of a change for it for Amsterdam? A change for Amsterdam. Yeah, hmm. it's well, actually red... it's, it's visible right on this this frame that oh, I paused this on. This is tricky. You're yeah. tricking me up here. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm being the professor. No, to tell the me, professor. John, what, what am I what am I missing? So I walked one, the street a ton. I, I can't believe I would miss it. <laughs> so one of the challenges, of course, with the cycle networks uh, throughout oh, yeah, Amsterdam. Yeah, I know now. I know. Yep. <laughs> what is it? It's the it's the motor scooters not Thank being you. on the uh, on the uh, cycle track. Yeah. Yeah. So give the background yeah. story. Yeah, so uh, it was just a couple years ago the, that when you would ride on uh, cycle tracks in Amsterdam, there would be motor scooters all over. Uh, and in fact, when you go ride in Rotterdam, there still are. They still are, uh, yeah. And uh, Amsterdam basically took uh, many of the uh, of cycle tracks and basically said you can't use motor scooters here before right. uh, before uh, in, in the future. And so now you see the motor scooters are out in traffic. Uh, and they, there are still some places where they can utilize them. There are signs that right. tell you, and then the motor scooters cheat in various places uh, right. as well. But dramatically different feel to riding in Amsterdam now than before. Uh, and basically, it, I mean, motor scooters, if they were going to go the same speed as bicyclists, it wouldn't really be that big a deal. There's a there's right. sort of a mass issue. They weigh more. Uh, but they go faster and they crowd you out. They're kind of like- And they were aggressive. Many of the drivers, uh, most of the drivers, in fact, were males and they uh, would lay on their horn and they would be aggressive. And I can remember elbows being thrown at me in 2015 when I was there. Oh, man, Uh, Less in 2018. uh, And then when I was there in 2019, uh, less again. And then now, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more of the scenes that look like this where, uh, you know, the, the cycle tracks have mostly been liberated from, uh, you know, from those noisy, uh, aggressive drivers on, yeah, on scooters. Yeah. So. It, it, it felt different, uh, dramatically different, but yeah. it, it, it's really one of those things where it's about mass and speed. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, any object that is going a certain speed, uh, you know, will yeah. fit together very well. Uh, and that's why you, uh, that's why the, the cycle tracks on the side of busier, higher speed streets are such a brilliant and important element of vision zero. If you're, if we're, if you're not doing that as part of vision zero, we don't really have vision zero because when you get hit at higher speeds with higher mass objects, really bad things happen. Right. And, and so that's what we need to maintain in these systems and think, and it, it speaks to a much larger issue about how do we incorporate electric bikes that move faster? How do we begin uh, to figure out how to do that? We'll leave that uh, for another day. Uh, but what you see in Amsterdam is really, uh, and you're right, I should have uh, pointed right out to that, is this uh, change that you see in terms of motor scooters uh, out in uh, cycle tracks. Yeah. So you sent this on over as well. So this is also in Amsterdam. What are we looking at here? Yeah, yeah. This is uh, this is going to be the uh, Feetstraat loop that we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the uh, what which segments. I think the red segments are the ones that are completed and the blue ones aren't. So you can't ride around uh, uh, currently uh, on this beautiful feet strut all the way around uh, central Amsterdam. Uh, but you can, in the uh, hopefully in the next three years or so, uh, be able to do this. Uh, and there was even talk of adding a second ring around uh, the city. Nice. Uh, and I, I think when you look at this, you kind of imagine uh, it kind of looks like an auto-oriented map, right? It looks right. like the belt belt loop around Houston or something. Right. <laughs> but it's a loop for bikes. Right. Uh, yeah. And it's a loop for livability right in the core of the city. And to me, that's why I sent you over this image was it really, you, you get this sort of sense of opportunity. Uh, and then imagine, uh, you know, we looked at the examples before, there's green infrastructure going in all all these places. Right. So in addition to just bikes and transportation, there's green infrastructure. And then when you sit next to these places, it's quiet and yeah. they're places. So all of a sudden it's this linked network place throughout the core of the city. Yeah. And and uh, Rotterdam is doing that, too. So this is the uh, talking about br- trying to incorporate yeah, and bring yeah, green yeah. In, into the city. Talk a little bit about this program. Yeah, th- and this is where it's, I think it's called Je- Jeveltwin. Uh, yeah. And the Bruntlets actually sent out uh, uh, information about this on their Twitter. Uh, and that's where I found the word. And I started to like backtrack and I went, 
I see all these amazing little mini gardens when I'm in the Netherlands. And I'm like, why, why is that? How does it work? Well, it's a program, particularly in Rotterdam, where they actually will give resources to people who take out kind of tiles. And basically, it allows for water to come through. So there's a water management perspective. But it also just creates this lovely street on the backside of uh, Rotterdam Central. I would just walk through the streets and there's all these little micro green places. So in addition to the larger green infrastructure that you see, there's all this micro green that's being established through these facade gardens. Uh, and they look they, they look just spectacular. I also, you can see that we're going Dutch to English. So a lot of this stuff is really accessible to you uh, through the magic of the internet. Uh, and I've learned so much. Uh, my Dutch is terrible. So I've learned so much translating plans. I'm like, oh, that's what's happening here. So I highly recommend that too. Yeah, yeah, that's good stuff. Philly, what have we not covered that you want to make sure that uh, we leave the audience with? To me, it is, it's what I, you know, as I, I said at the beginning, I, I'm a researcher who studies this and I have a long-term research plan to look at land use and resilience. And that's really the work that I'm getting ready to do next. But as, as a person who just spent, you know, a month traveling and now I'm back in the U.S., I'm left it, with this strange sort of feeling. I, I sense opportunity with all of these amazing images that, uh, that we showed. There's so much that we could be doing. And then I walk around my neighborhood and I have this sense <laughs> of that not happening. Uh, and really uh, what I think uh, we need to be thinking about is the, the sort of opportunities for change within our neighborhood. Uh, I'm getting ready to work on a project in San Marcos, Texas. This is such a great project in Utrecht, by the way. Uh, this is a buffered cycle track, uh, kind of a cycle track 2.0 green infrastructure on the side, just down uh, from Rotterdam, I mean, from uh, Utrecht Central. Imagine this in your neighborhood. That's what's going on in my mind, right? I have this image in my head when I'm in my neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, but most of the people in my neighborhood do not have this image in their heads, right? So I'm getting ready to work on a project in San Marcos where we're bringing together public health, active transportation, economic development, water management folks. San Marcos is blessed with this amazing spring-fed river, uh, and we're trying to keep that river uh, clean. So adding green infrastructure to keep pollution from flowing in is important. But at the same time, uh, what we're doing to the world by burning oil and gas is uh, changing the climate. And what we need to do is figure out how to keep our local communities clean through green infrastructure, but also to have walking, biking, transit be privileged so that we decrease our greenhouse gas emissions. And what we're trying to do over the next uh, year is bring this group of people together and create this kind of common template of what we'd like to see for San Marcos. It could be Austin, where I also am. Could be your neighborhood. What does your neighborhood look like? I actually really like uh, MobyCon. MobyCon is based out of Delft. Uh, and they were one of the first ones to really introduce me uh, to these ideas. Uh, I sat down with Angela Vanderkloof uh, recently, and uh, she lives in Tilburg and just really pleasant. Uh, and one of the things that MobyCon sent out was uh, a tweet that said, how do we, uh, what would you do in your neighborhood to make it more social? Right. Uh, and I just think that's such a powerful question and a question that doesn't get asked when we talk about transportation. How do we make it more friendly? How do we make it more social? Uh, and starting with those questions, I think, can be a, a really valuable place to start. It takes us in a different place. And then you end up with lovely places like this. La Perla is my favorite little pizza place in the Jordan. Uh, you saw the guy carrying the pizzas. This family, I was sitting outside just eating pizza and watching this parade of beautiful people and, and go by. Here's this uh, family, two kids that actually the I think the dad is on the other side and there was another kid who was uh, trailing behind on a bike. Just spectacular. These type of places are open to us if we th rethink our transportation and our land use. Yeah. And then uh, my favorite thing from La Perla is the restaurant is on one side of the street and the pizza oven is on the other. So they have to walk back and forth across the street to bring the pizza to you. Just lovely. Highly yes. recommend that experience. <laughs> Traffic calmed by pizza. <laughs> by pizza, yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, Billy. Thank you so much. It has been absolutely a joy, a pleasure, and an honor to have you back on the uh, Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much, sir. 
Thanks, John. It was lovely. And I'm, I'm jealous now of you getting to go back again. So have a great time. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Professor Billy Fields. And if you did, uh, remember, please give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below. And uh, please do share it with a friend. And please help spread the word about the Active Towns movement and being able to create more places for all ages and abilities. I really do appreciate it. And I really do appreciate you tuning in for each of these episodes. Uh, it means so much to me. After next week's episode, which will be the season finale for season three with Doug Gordon from the War on Cars podcast, uh, I will be taking a few weeks off, so about two to three weeks off from the podcast, but I will be putting out some profile videos up from Colorado, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Cheers.